Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today I wanted to get a little bit ahead of the game of homesteading um, and tell you about some of the things for your fall to-do list. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today are things for um, late September and throughout October. So let's, let's get started and dig in because now the air is cooler the leaves are starting to fall here in Maine and there's so many weird and wonderful fungi popping up in the woodlands like I find myself wanting to be outside so much more and now I'm finally over um, the majority of the issues um, from COVID I've been trying to get out a little bit more getting some fresh air and um you know we've been exploring our property we've been hiking with neighbors and we've been seeing some really really cool things that we found on our property that i didn't know that we had um so i found um some filberts or hazel trees that were further down the property i found another pear tree we found grapes hardy kiwi and elderberries just to name a few so it's been quite exciting um getting out and being able to see what's really there because this is really our first full year here on on the property we're coming up to of being here for the full year and it's kind of exciting finding something new each time and as we're going through and we're clearing things and you know just kind of exploring and seeing what's there um you know we're getting a better understanding of what the land had been used for and really what what the land is kind of already starting to become and here on mossy bottom we have been clearing brush by hand a lot um i i can't even tell you how much i i have cleared and you know we've not had really um a lot of tools to do it um we have like an electric hedge trimmer which has been really great at cutting down a lot of the goldenrod that has just kind of exploded everywhere that's been really great but also just kind of generally like cutting things back with you know a basic you know weed thing um and um, mowing a lot of mowing um, a lot of mowing by hand with a push mower because our ride on lawn mowers are temperamental at best um, so <laughs> I think at this point like a goat would be a lot easier <laughs> um, but we've been mowing and really getting ready to put in some fencing around the main garden so um, today um, here on the homestead I'm going to be putting in a lot of fence posts it is an arm workout day for sure um, but once that fence is in like I can really focus on putting in more no dig beds which are going to sit until spring when the planting begins I'm going to be moving the compost bins transplanting blackberries and raspberries and that really brings me to one of my first tasks for fall which is planting cane fruits um, or soft fruits so think things like blackberries raspberries and their um, relatives like boysenberries dewberries thimbleberries tayberry loganberry there's lots of different cane fruits that are available now and you can pick these up as plants to transplant in the garden um, from nurseries or garden centers but you can also order them online um, and if you have more of a thicket um, than an easy to access and harvest berry patch already in your garden like I do um, then now is a really good time to split and divide them and move them to a new location in the garden um, or even swap them with friends and neighbors um, if you're moving from like an existing patch um, then you want to be pruning those canes that have already fruited this season if you haven't done already but generally your berry plants will also appreciate some mulch around the base of the plants some compost or well rotted manure if you're using that um, can also be spread around the base of the plants and that's going to help them have you know a more nutritious soil to really kind of pump out um, bigger berries for the next year and um, don't forget that fall is when you need to be ordering your fruit trees to be delivered in spring for planting or in winter depending on where you are I know when I lived in the UK and I ordered plants um, in fall they arrived in winter for planting so it really depends on where you are but here in the US majority of the time if you're putting in your fruit tree order now um, you'll be getting them in spring um, but just know that if you're ordering online or by a catalogue you want to be placing your order early 
early um, to make sure that you're not disappointed. But it's really important to make strategic decisions about what it is that you're going to grow to make sure that you have appropriate pollination partners for your fruit trees. Um, and if you're interested about that, check out um, the podcast episodes that I've done previously about growing an orchard to learn more. Like we've been having a look at a few different um, varieties of fruit trees that I've got sitting in my cart um, at the moment before I, um, you know, hit the the pay now button. Um, But I've got a few a few things that, you know, my husband and I kind of talked about as we went through. So when we're looking at fruit that we're going to be getting, especially for things like apples, um, because I love apples and we've got, you know, orchards nearby and I'm just you know waiting for the northern spy apples to come ready and then i will probably be buying a bushel or two of them because they're delicious Um, but um no when it comes to you know what what is it that we're looking for in the fruit like my husband has a really good way of kind of evaluating stuff because he's he's somewhat indifferent in terms of like the varieties of things that we're growing in the garden doesn't really care but when it comes to things like fruit he's looking for how well does it store is it something that's going to store all winter and into the spring is it something that works good in pies like can we cook it and it holds its shape for a pie or is it just going to turn into a soupy mush and how does it make you know a applesauce is it something that cooks down very readily or is it something um that tends to keep its shape whereas i'm looking for things you know from basically from the UK right where I'm from so there's varieties that I deeply deeply miss from you know where I grew up and um, I want to be able to have some of those you know here on my homestead or something that's very similar Um, I've also been looking at varieties that are you know from here in Maine like all varieties that you know have been recovered and they're now you know commercially available basically um and by commercially i mean you know to the general public um so that's kind of exciting to be able to have like a mixture of things that we know grow they're hardy the varieties that other homesteaders have used since you know the 1700s and given that my home is from the 1700s also i kind of feel like you know i should have some of these old varieties here just as a a kind of nod to the heritage um that was that was here but you know i'm looking for more of these you know varieties that are kind of for cooking um rather than eating although there are a few varieties that were for eating but having like my husband and i go through all the varieties that i've kind of narrowed down and i use the term narrowed down in a really loose way because we went through about 20 different varieties and kind of narrowed things down of like yep yeah, these are things that you know we're, we're looking for so we narrowed it down based on like hey this is just a picture and I really like the look of this or I read the description and I really like the look of this so that was one way that we chose and then I started looking up the varieties that were there and then trying to find out what the pollination group was so started to look at those what ones were similar what were within the same pollination group and then grouping those together and then we started to go through them as a couple and my husband putting in his you know his sensible hat of like okay what's going to be a good keeper what is a good eating apple and what also is a good cooking apple or cider apple like we want things that are multi-purpose right kind of like the chickens we wanted chickens that are multi-purpose do they do good meat do they do good eggs yes okay great because then I don't have to have like separate animals for everything and then that's even more stuff to look after same for things like the fruit and the apples like what are these things that check all of those three boxes if it checks all of those three boxes and it's also a good pollination partner then it goes on the list Um, if it's ones that do not have um, good pollination partners then you know we kind of put it to the side and if it becomes something that like yes 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 I absolutely want this like my homestead isn't complete without this um, then it will get added back into the cart to purchase but most of the time it doesn't it's something that we can you know let it 
let it go be like Elsa let it go um and and that's been really good for us to kind of avoid like over overspending especially you know when you're sort of hit with this oh my gosh I've got to order these things all now otherwise I'm going to run out and then I'm going to be disappointed and then it's going to be another year before I get fruit here and having like your orchard established early on your homestead is better because it can take it takes a number of years before things will start to produce fruit like walnuts it can take 10 years um at least before you start seeing you know walnuts being produced so um that's that's something that has been working very well for us is really kind of being strategic about what it is that we're looking for long term on the property and what it is that we we need as as a family um to be able to have this kind of self-sufficient lifestyle so just a couple of additional um things that we've been thinking about and how our process of choosing things works here now if you're lucky um you might still find fruit trees in pots at ver various um big box stores and um, they're often discounted at this time of year um and if you can get them into their forever growing space in your garden um in fall as soon as you can um they will have a chance to establish before the winter weather arrives um, same for any perennial shrubs. I saw a ton of roses um, heavily discounted in a home improvement store uh, yesterday, actually, um, and even fig trees. Um, I'm very proud of myself for not picking up the fig trees um, and actually having like, because I love figs and my husband loves figs and um that was like one of the things like my husband had a lot of when he grew up in Texas was there was figs all over the place. Um, and I would love to have a fig tree. Um, I had one in the UK. My parents now have it and it produces figs for them. I really miss having figs. But honestly, like even though it's it's for sale here in a big box store, I really doubt that a fig tree is going to make it. And certainly right now, like I don't have time to be trying to figure out like well where's the warmest place to put this and you know be able to have it grow successfully like I, I don't have time for that but um, for somebody else who's in a different part of the world or a different part of um, here in America like you you might have a really good time um, looking for a bargain or two you know for the flower garden and even the edible garden by checking out some of these heavily discounted plants that are at a home improvement store like there was even house plants and i would love to have house plants i just i don't trust um my dogs honestly <laughs> um they they will tear things up right now and even though i would love to have things that are hanging and you know nice nice indoor flowers and um you know house plants like i'm i'm particularly fond of the spider house plant um because you know my family had a lot of them when i was growing up and it was like one of the first plants that i learned to grow was a, a spider plant um and propagate so that was kind of fun but no no we decided not to do that um and just to focus on on the fencing um but you know th this is a really good time to go shopping for some things because even if you find a plant that's you know a little bit neglected um you might still be able to you know revive it and have it you know grow well the following season so um take a look take a look um fall is also when you need to place grease bands on your trees to stop certain moths from setting up shop in your trees so um around winter oh sort of fall is when um wingless females crawl up into the tree um so they crawl up in autumn they lay eggs that then hatch in spring and then you know the caterpillars start like eating all the leaves and the blossoms and burrowing into fruit and stuff and you know if you've had kind of fruit that you you know you've looked at whether you've been foraging or you've been to an orchard or even if you have trees like coddling moths in the uk were a pain in the bum and um my parents have an old apple tree in their garden i mean it's at least 30 something years old because and it was big when i was little because i used to climb up in it all the time and they had a pear tree um until that um finally succumbed to blight but i remember <laughs> 
each year, you know, when we would get apples and pears and stuff, you learned very quickly to try and eat certain parts of those because, I mean, what's worse, you know, what's more worse than finding a, you know, a worm or, you know, a maggot or something in your apple um, or your pear? Well, it's finding half of it in there because you've eaten the other half. Like, ugh, ugh, that still gives me nightmares now. Um but having these grease bands or strict sticky traps that go around the trunk of the tree so you basically put them around the trunk and um, as those wingless females crawl up the the trunk they get stuck on the sticky trap and are not able to lay their eggs so um, there's various organic sticky traps and grease bands that are available and they're very effective um, at controlling these winter moths so if you have a problem with that, then take a look at those. I have um, an old um, pear tree here on the property. Um, there's actually two pear trees and weirdly they were planted like right behind each other rather than offset. Um, and both of them, um, the one that gets the most sun obviously has a lot more fruit and things on it. Um, but all of them have kind of got some signs of, um, you know, moth damage and stuff on there so um definitely this year this is something that we're going to be doing is to really start taking back um you know some of these fruit trees and things that we have we're going to be pruning things out and really helping them you know get a, a better flourish and actually as cutting down a lot of the the overgrowth of weeds and stuff last year um actually helped us enormously get a much bigger um you know harvest because when we came to look at the property there was maybe like a couple of i mean it, it had fruit on it but nowhere near the amount that we had um this year and i know some years you get a lot bigger flush of fruits and things on trees and then you know you'll have like a a smaller yield over the next few years and then again you'll get another flush of them um but i think as we're actually starting to make improvements to the land and you know really start to care for things again you know it's it's going to be doing better and it's going to be getting healthier um as we do some of those things so I digress. Um, let's talk about making more plants because dividing an unruly berry patch isn't the only thing that you can do to make more plants. There is lots of perennial shrubs that you can split to make more plants and transplant them in to a new place in your garden. Chives, daylilies, hosta, peony, bearded iris, shasta daisy, echinacea or coneflower, um, <clears throat> rudbeckia, catmint, bugleweed, chrysanthemums, ladies mantle and mint are just a few plants that you can divide to make more and that's a really good idea right to make more plants without having to spend money i love that and having these skills to be able to propagate your plants you know is is a good thing just generally to know anyway um but as you start to get more comfortable with gardening you're going to find that you'll want to do more things like this you know you're going to find that you've got these lovely perennial um flowers or something that you you want to have in multiple places and not everything grows well from seeds some things grow better by dividing them and um a lot of these flowers are and uh, plants are pretty good at you know taking the abuse of having to dig them out split them with a garden fork and then take various portions of them and plant them in different areas um plants do it they've been you know there's lots of videos and things to be able to see how to do this kind of thing and really the best way for you to do it is to actually have a go and try doing it not everything will take and i just i, I want you to be well aware of that like how however you grow your garden whether it's from seeds or you're doing a, a division of plants or you're taking cuttings like not everything grows and it's okay and it doesn't mean that you're you know a total failure as a garden like sometimes things just just don't grow you know it might be that it was too much for it to be divided it might be that 
you know the the wrong bit of um the cutting was taken it might have been too dry you know the the spot that you've transplanted it into isn't isn't ideal it's only by actually getting into our garden and trying and doing some of these things that number one we learn more new skills and number two we see what works and what doesn't and if we keep trying new things and we keep trying to you know transplant plants or sown seeds in different areas like that's really the only way that we're able to you know successfully grow our gardens and try something new and sometimes us kind of doing something just to see what will happen that's sometimes when the best things happen in our garden so don't be afraid to try some of these things if you have a giant hosta pile that is way out of control and you want to move it to somewhere else then try doing it daylilies are one of the easier things to grow um i think getting them not to grow is usually the challenge um i mean i i found patches of daylilies in the woods here on our property where somebody obviously pulled them out and then threw them in the woods and then they started growing again i quite like daylilies i've got some really interesting daylily um flowers there's some that are like a deep deep kind of burgundy red with like peachy orange flushed on the outside they're beautiful um so it's kind of nice having them and i i quite like having you know plants like that that are um very good at sort of covering ground that i don't need to worry too much about however um i don't want daylilies growing right up against the side of the house um where you know, I'm providing shelter for various rodents because I do not want the critter in the walls again. Um, so being able to dig up some of these plants, move them to somewhere else where they can happily grow is um, something that is definitely on my list for around the homestead this fall. Um, but also when you're making more plants, taking cuttings. You can try taking lots of cuttings from lots of different plants and trying to get them to take root over the fall and winter. Um, and there's lots of different cuttings that you can take. You can take softwood cuttings, um, which are typically taken in spring or early summer then there's um semi hard cuttings which are usually taken around early fall and then there's hardwood cuttings which are taken in late fall and early winter and um it's different to grafting grafting your fruit trees is something very different um but taking cuttings of plants is a little bit more forgiving um again sometimes things work really well some things don't um Plants that typically work for cuttings are things like lavender, dogwood, rose of Sharon and hibiscus, wigilia, forsythia, uh, cotoneaster, beauty bush, bay trees, um, rosemary, elderberry, roses, hydrangeas, holly, currants and my favourite jasmine are just to name a few. There's lots of videos available online to show you how to take cuttings for various plants so it's just a case of searching for the plant that you want to try taking a cutting of and how to do it and finding a video that you you like and is able to show you how to do it. I mean when I was growing up in the UK you know my my family would watch Gardener's World all the time and that's kind of where I learned a lot of how to do things um that my family didn't really know how to do or didn't show me how to do it was kind of watching that TV show to see how to do stuff and now you know we have YouTube and things so it's much easier for us to find out what it is that we're looking to do so it's a resource that i use all the time um and it's one that's definitely worth you using too so take a look and see if there's some cuttings that you can take because it's definitely a skill worth knowing to help keep your gardening hobby a little bit cheaper um i was certainly very successful doing it with elderberries in the uk um which was great because i was able to take a very good elderberry plant that was great for making um elderflower champagne but also elderberry wine and i just made new plants and elderberry is one that kind of grows very easily anyway um certainly in um a climate like i had in the uk but you know not everything that i um took the cutting of worked and that's okay um i i tried taking lots of different cuttings of different plants and some of them worked very well some of them didn't and 
you know having um you know a good practice at trying some of these things um was very very helpful in you know having skills a little bit later because now i feel a bit more confident in taking cuttings of different plants um i know some of the tricks that you know help things grow a little bit better so for me one of the tricks that i learned from um taking cuttings was having a more sandier soil um for the plants or the cuttings to grow into and some people when they take cuttings just put it straight into sand and it grows very well um for them so um take a look at different different methods and see what will work for you and the climate that you are in because every garden's different every garden is different and that's totally okay um, let's talk about sowing seeds next because fall might not make sense for sowing seeds for many of you listening, especially if you're in cold states like I am in Maine. But for lots of plants, the winter temperatures are what triggers germination in spring and that's known as stratifying your seeds. It works a treat for wildflowers here in the northern states. Um, sow your wildflower seeds in a bed that's free from weeds, lightly, and I mean really lightly, rake the soil and seeds, just kind of you know cover them a little bit because sometimes some of the wildflowers are actually triggered by the sunlight germinating them like pepper seeds are the same they like to be on top of the soil surface so they get the light um, and then that helps them emerge in spring but once you've sown them and very lightly raked them in just water them and that's it leave them be until the seedlings emerge in spring and if you're trying to juggle sowing wildflowers or other flowers and stuff as well as sowing your edible vegetables take a good look at the seed packets and see if it is something that you can sow in fall because you might be surprised there's lots of flowers that you can actually sow in fall and then you're not having to kind of worry about them and juggle doing them while you're trying to to get all of your edible um, plants started so take a look at that and depending on where you live you might also have enough time to sow some fall cover crops and green manures to help build your soil in your garden um, there's lots of good um, information available for cover crops green manures and you know what should be sown in fall versus what should be sown in you know very early spring um so take take some time to do a bit of research if you're looking for fall cover crops um and green manures and you're wanting to start adding that into your garden versus um you know relying on things like adding well rotted manure and stuff to your garden instead now for those of you listening in warmer regions you can keep sowing and growing so many plants um fava beans peas um <coughs> oh sorry <coughs> still battling some of these after effects um when i'm talking for too long um but yes for those of you listening in warmer regions there's a lots of things you can keep keep growing fava beans peas cool weather salad crops um asian greens kale or just to name a few that you can sow and in some areas you can even sow potatoes in the fall so um you know have have a look check out your local extension office um certainly if you're here in the u.s and see what you can be growing in fall you might be surprised fall is also when you sow garlic traditionally and to sow garlic, you want to pull apart the garlic, uh, the cloves from the bulb. You want to keep those papery skins on the clove and then plant the clove um, so that the flat bottom on the fatter bit of the garlic is down into the ground and the pointy end is pointing up to the sky. Sowing bigger cloves will give you the bigger bulbs of garlic, but if you have what I call tiddly garlic cloves, those will grow too. They'll just be a lot smaller and um sometimes like it's worth growing them sometimes it isn't um what i tend to do with the tiddly garlic cloves is i'll just kind of randomly put them in garden beds um just so there's kind of you know garlic growing in there because garlic's one of those plants that's really good at kind of deterring lots of pests so i like to kind of grow garlic in various places around the garden just to kind of help with that integrated pest management 
Um, now's also a really good time to be cutting back your cornstalks if they've been harvested. Um, same with asparagus, sunflowers, and Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. These are great carbon additions to the compost heap. Um, but also, these are plants that certainly with the the corn and the sunflowers and the Jerusalem artichokes, like we want to get those out of the garden um, because they tend to um, harbor various. Um, pests over winter so you don't necessarily have to like be pulling them up out of the ground but just kind of cutting them you know sort of close ish to the ground or leaving a couple of inches leaving some of the stubble on there um because they will break down over the winter and you know as your garden gets growing like i've left the stubble of corn stalks and sunflowers in the garden before and grown other things in that area and they they weren't bothered about those breaking down um you know like i said it's, it's a great addition of carbon into the compost heap but also those roots go pretty far down and it's able to you know have things break down and they're adding more nutrients back into the soil that's there so we don't want to waste anything but we want to be pulling out things that are you know the last of the summer crops and things that um you know we really want to be clearing from the garden bed are those plants that are particularly prone to diseases like tomatoes right that's got to be the poster child for you know having issues with lots of different diseases in the garden and we want to be pulling those out of the garden bed. We want to be clearing away any debris. We don't want to be leaving behind like leaves or, you know, rotting tomatoes and things because we're going to be leaving behind some of these pathogens to overwinter in the soil. And, you know, make sure to write in your garden journal where you were growing some of these veggie plants, right? Um, so you know where they were and you can figure out where to rotate your plants to, you know, in the next season so they're not growing in the same space year after year we don't want a build-up of those diseases in our soils because they can take decades to really disappear so we want to be able to give our plants the appropriate space and break by doing crop rotation and if you're not sure what crop rotation is i've written several blog posts about it and um, i know i've definitely talked about crop rotation on the podcast so definitely check those out um because that's that's a really easy way that you can help reduce pests and diseases in your garden is just by not growing things in the same place year after year and also clearing debris means that you have a chance to spread some compost um, or well rotted manure in your garden and put some mulch on those garden beds to help feed the soil and protect the soil from winter so your garden bed's ready for next spring it's also a good time to make new beds and as i mentioned earlier i'm putting in new no dig garden beds now is a great time to expand or even start a garden um, and to do that you want to mark out the shape of your garden bed you want to cover that area with at least two layers of cardboard and then start layering on compost or well rotted manure mulches like straw fall leaves or wood chips get inspired and look at some no dig or no till garden beds online and see what you can do in your garden um you might be surprised at you know how easy these garden beds are to put together and you might be even more surprised by how productive they are in the years to come now it's also a really good time to make leaf mold and leaf mold is amazing in the garden it's great as a mulch it can also be used as a seed starting mix too you can add it to you know a current seed starting mix or you can even use that completely as your seed starting mix in some cases um to make leaf mold you basically take all your raked up fall leaves and you can put them into a dedicated compost bin to break down um or you can add them to your normal compost pile and you know just add them you know as as compost or you can use the fall leaves as mulch straight on your garden beds and that's what I did back in Utah and that's how I turned really poor sandy soil into something that could retain water and grow a very productive garden and I'll share a little secret with you my friend fall leaves and compost have been my main soil feeding strategies in every garden that I have grown and you want to know the best bit 
it's been free, totally free. And now that, you know, I don't have um, a bag or anything attached to my mower, unfortunately. So, you know, I have to rely on the old fashioned raking strategy, which is fine because I really need the exercise. I, I really need the exercise. Might be a bit slow going um, at the minute with uh, dealing with the post COVID issues. But, you know, if you have a bag on your mower, picking up fall leaves from the lawn is super, super easy. And yes, running your leaves through a mulcher after raking them up is an extra step, but it does mean that they break down faster, which means that it feeds your soil faster too. So if you are quite impatient, then, you know, running things through a mulcher or mowing them and stuff is, is an easy way to break things up. But honestly, what I did a lot of was I would rake up um, the leaves from various trees, like we had maples and birch trees in in Utah and I just raked them all onto the garden bed and the ones where I had the raised beds I would rake them up into a pile um, my dogs would jump into the pile of leaves because it was fun and then we would rake them up again <laughs> and then we would start like um, loading up we had these plastic like bucket tub things and we just pile a bunch of them into there take them to the raised garden beds dump them on there and just cover everything and that would be it i would just leave them like that that's not a pun intended leaf leave never mind um so i would just leave everything there over winter and then when it came to you know sowing seeds or um you know, planting things in spring, I would just move some of those leaves out of the way um, to sow my seeds. And then I would um, break up some of the leaves, kind of rub them in your hands to, to break them up a bit and then lightly cover up that area. Because if you leave your leaves in a large pile, like in the middle of the lawn, for example, you will actually kill off the grass that's under there because they are very, very good at blocking out the light. Um, which, you know, is good in some ways, but probably not good in the middle of your lawn. Um, so, you know, knowing that they do that when I'm sowing seeds, I don't really want like big old leaves covering where I've sown the seeds because I want my seedlings to be able to get to the light and uh, be able to grow. So just kind of moving things out of the way, recovering a little bit with some, you know, finer material or just, you know, moving the leaves out of the way and putting compost on top was, was a good strategy. And, you know, if you're transplanting bigger plants, then it's not really an issue because you just move the leaves out of the way, transplant your plant and then you can you know push the leaves around the base of the plant and it's already going to help keep um the moisture in and as those leaves continue to break down over the season because they take a longer time to break down they're going to be adding some of those nutrients into the soil for you and one of the things that i noticed when i used leaves and as mulch I had a lot more earthworms that started coming into the garden and my garden began to flourish very very rapidly after probably two years of just using leaves as being the mulch and some grass clippings and stuff like that's that's really when my garden started to take off because the soil was improving um, a lot better and we were creating habitat for some of these um you know fauna that lived on you know in the soil and um were you know they were happy where they were um so that's that's something to think about if you're wanting to bring in more earthworms you're looking for something that is free and easy to feed your garden you can't really go wrong with making leaf mold and compost so i would love to hear from you what are some of the things that you are doing in your homestead garden for this fall let me know over in the facebook group until next time i hope your garden grows beautifully and i will see you next week <music>